backwards. Or weirdly, uh, we might have to get you to leave this building and come back into the same building, but through a slightly different entrance, because that's where the queue will be. Uh, this is all part of our sort of COVID restrictions and all that sort of thing. So that's a bit of an, an annoyance uh, straight up. But if you haven't seen those exhibitions, they are super cool. So uh, please, I do encourage you to go and, uh, and have a look at that. Anyway, nobody wants to hear more about uh, health and safety stuff. So uh, we will uh, we'll meet our first speaker of the day. Now, I'm going to read this because I want to make sure that I'm getting this correct. Uh, our, our speaker is uh, Henry Burgess, uh, and he's the head of, so I'll get this in the right order, uh, head of the National Environment Research Council, this is N NERC, uh, uh, the Arctic Office, which is hosted by the British Antarctic uh, Survey. Uh, the office is uh, physically in Svalbard in Norway. Everybody's, everybody's still keeping track yes good okay good uh, and that supports UK uh, Arctic research activity uh, advice for uh, policy and uh, develops international scientific uh, collaboration uh, across all aspects of Arctic research um, so today Henry is going to be talking to us about life in the Arctic science nature and us and I think without further ado I'm going to hand it over to you Henry Great. thank you very much thank you Right, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate kind of having such a, a young and uh, also mature audience, a mixed audience. That's really great to see you all. Thank you very much for being here today. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Arctic, basically. Uh, and as Ed said, we do have a stand upstairs. If you would like to come to the exhibition, we can talk, you, talk, talk more about kind of what we do uh, in the Arctic. So I'd like to give you a snapshot of uh, the life in the Arctic, science, nature, and us. Uh, this is me at our Arctic station, and I'm going to be using our Arctic station to tell you a little bit about kind of life in the Arctic and, and what we do, and introducing you to some of the animals uh, and some of the science uh, and the cool things we, we do there. Um, but first, just to get us going, because it's the first talk of the day, uh, and just to do a bit of a quiz on Arctic animals. So, north is that way, and south is that way. The North Pole is about two and a half thousand miles that way, so a long way. The South Pole is about nine and a half thousand miles in the other direction. So I'm going to put up some animals, and I'd like you to point to where you think they come from. So if they come from the North Pole, point north to the front of the auditorium, and if they come from the south, point kind of behind you. Uh, and if you're too shy to point, just incline your head in one way <laughs> or, the, or the other. Uh, so, first test is this animal. Very good. Everyone's pointing north. Yeah, so we get these animals around the station. I'll show you some pictures in a bit about kind of when we've seen them quite, quite close to the station. Uh, what about this animal, a walrus? This is a shy walrus. He's slightly kind of hiding his, hiding his eyes. People aren't quite so confident. Some people are pointing backwards, but most forwards. So this is a walrus, they only live in the Arctic. We have some of these near the station, um, but they only live in the Arctic. You get elephant seals, things like that, in the Antarctic, 9,000 miles that way. But these ones are all a couple of thousand miles that way. Or around Ireland or Pembrokeshire, when that one kind of floated kind of nearer over the summer. Uh, what about these ones? These are daily penguins. These live, uh, that's right, everyone's pointing south. So these are thousands of miles that way in the Antarctic. Uh, what about this one? So this is an orca, otherwise known as a killer whale, but orca is a, is a better name for it. So people, people are pointing to the north, and some people pointing to the south, and if you're pointing both ways, then that's right. So these live in the north, and they also live in the south. They don't move between, they're distinct populations. So the ones that live in the south permanently live in the south, and the ones that live in the north permanently live in the north. This is, I think, taken in Antarctica. Uh, you can see the whale has popped up, and it's what they call um, spy hopping. So it's coming up to see what's around. And can you see on the far right-hand side of the image there, there's a seal. So it's looking at the seal, that brown object. That's what it's looking for, not the person. Um, but I think it's taken this guy kind of completely by surprise. Um, but that's a, that's, a, that's a good image. So these are, these are both north and south, but they don't move between them. Uh, what about this one? This is Vulpes legopus, otherwise known as the Arctic fox. So these only live in the north. Uh, this is taken just around our station uh, in, in Svalbard. So these are the puppies. They can have very big litters. They can have up to 20. Um, but it's unusual to have as many as that, but this is more, this is more typical. Uh, and they, 
they're like this in the summer, and then in the winter they go completely white, just blend in with the, with the snow. So these only live in the Arctic, that one. And then what about this one? This is the final one. This is a tern. So some people are pointing south, some people are pointing north. If you're pointing both ways, then you're right. So these, these are Arctic, Antarctic terns, uh, and a large proportion of them will migrate between the two. So they'll never see a winter. They spend the summer in the Arctic, and then they fly all the way from 2,000 miles that way, the best part of 9,000 miles that way, and so they, 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 they live in both parts. So that's an introduction to some of the wildlife and the animals of the Arctic. But I also want to talk about humans in the Arctic, uh, because we think about the wildlife, but and the Arctic is a, is a populated place, and this image, which is owned by the National Maritime Museum, but is out for restoration at the moment, rather than being on display, is how a lot of people, I think, thought about the Arctic who didn't live in the Arctic for a, for a long time. Uh, so this is William Barrett. Uh, he discovered the Svalbard uh, archipelago, which we'll be talking about, uh, but he didn't live uh, much longer after discovering it. So there were 16 people in this photograph, and only 12 of them survived. They died uh, after a shipwreck and exposure and bear attack and, and other things. So for a long time, this is how people thought about the Arctic. It was a place of exploration, it was a place of danger, it was a place where you went to be a hero, and if you came back, you were lucky, uh, and if not, this kind of thing would, would happen. Um, but the Arctic is very much a place of humans these days. There are big cities in the Arctic, there are indigenous communities, Inuit, Sami, Nenets people who live in the Arctic. There are four million people that live north of the Arctic Circle, and one in ten of those are indigenous communities, people that trace their ancestry and their connection back to the land and the way of life of, of living on the land. Um, the Arctic is not just green, not, sorry, not just ice and snow and glaciers, it's also green. This is in uh, Alaska and northern Canada, uh, this kind of scrubland. And the Arctic is increasingly a place of, of tourism. Uh, this is the Crystal Serenity ship that went through the Northwest Passage, a part going through kind of the northern part of, of Canada. Uh, so the Arctic is a place of, of tourism, and, and all these things are true and real parts of, of the Arctic. But what I wanted to talk to you about, particularly today, was our station in Svalbard. So the red dot is the North Pole. Uh, we are the red star down at the bottom, uh, and that cir yellow circle there is Svalbard, otherwise known as Spitsbergen, and that's where we have the UK's only permanent Arctic research facility. So the ship that you may have seen in the Thames, that can go to the Arctic, but it also goes south and does other things all around the world. Uh, but our only permanent facility is here in Svalbard, uh, our research station. And it's in this place, New Orleans, right on the western coast of Svalbard. And it's a really interesting place to be because when you think of the Atlantic Ocean, which is kind of down here, and all that warm water is coming up past Svalbard into the Arctic Ocean. So all the changes that you see in Svalbard, and this place is warming two, three times quicker than the rest of the world. All those changes are happening in this part of the world, particularly quickly, which makes it a really interesting, sadly, place to visit and to, and to study. So this is our station in the fjord here. Uh, and it's a place that you may know about uh, through this film, and um, Philip Pullman and his book. So this is the Golden Compass, his Dark Materials series. So Svalbard, Spitsbergen was the place of the polar bears uh, where, they would, where they would live. Uh, and we do have a lot of polar bears on Svalbard. There are 2,000 people, roughly, that live in Svalbard. It's about the same size as Scotland. Most of it is snow and glacier and ice, uh, but there are more bears than people. So 3,000 bears-ish live around Svalbard. And they do come and visit the station occasionally. This is how people get there. So you can get a regular flight from Heathrow into Oslo or to Tromso. Uh, in northern Norway, and then you get a shuttle up to Longyearbyen, which is the main airport, and then this is the plane you get in for the final hop to New Orleans and our station. Everyone gets a window seat, so that's what it looks like inside the plane. Uh, so when you take visitors up there, you say, um, you know, give us 10 quid and I'll get you a window seat. Uh, but everyone gets, everyone gets a window seat, and that's guaranteed. Uh, it's quite cold on the plane, so everyone's wearing their coats and their jackets and hats and all of that kind of thing. Uh, and there's no door, so you can see the pilot uh, and they fly relatively, they fly relatively low. So, whoa, that's loud. So this is what you would see outside the window. This is flying from Longyearbyen to our, to our station. Uh, these mountains are about 1,000 meters high, something like that. So think of it a bit like the Lake District or Scotland. And all the snow there, you can see, is overlying glaciers. So this is snow that's fallen over decades, hundreds of years, 
and is forming the glaciers that cover most of Svalbard and it's all slowly flowing out to the, to the sea. So on a clear day in the summer, this is what you would see. Often it's foggy or cloudy and you can't see it, but on a really good day, this is, this is what you can see. And this is what it's like when you get there. This is drone footage of the community. So you can see all these little buildings and that kind of concrete bit at the end. And weirdly, it's an old coal mining community. So the Norwegians mined coal here, and now it's an international research station. We have our station here, so, does the, so do the Chinese, the Japanese, Koreans, Germans, French, lots of different countries. Uh, and it's a real hub, a real international community for, for doing science. No one lives there permanently. People might be there for a couple of years, um, but no one lives kind of longer than, longer than that. But it's more or less the nearest permanently established establishment uh, to the North Pole. It's about a uh, just over a thousand kilometers from here to the North Pole. Uh, and this is what our station looks like. Um, so if you'd like a tour, I can't physically take you to the station, but I can show you some footage of what the inside of the station looks like. So we'll, we'll give that a go. Welcome to the UK's Arctic station here in Jonathan Svalbard. I'm Henry Burgess from the Natural Environment Research Council Arctic Office. Come inside the station and have a look. So this is the boot room. This is where we take all our boots off to make sure we keep the outside out uh, and the inside in. It's usually a bit tidier than this, but uh, we've had a lot of people here over the last week or so. Uh, this is the centre of the station. Uh, this is where we people sign in and out, where we keep the radios, where we do the briefings. And I'll show you the laboratory. You can just through here. We've got our team from the University of Manchester with their meteorite hunting equipment. And on this side. On this side, we have what's normally our sitting room, uh, but for now it's been turned into a BBC Radio 4 Today programme studio. Uh, they've just finished broadcasting for this week, uh, and they're packing up all their gear. So if you come down this way, come on, keep it quick. This is the station manager's office. Uh, he lives in there. Uh, and then we have the team from the BBC Today programme. Uh, they're just packing up. They've got all their gear here. Uh, this is Tom Fielder from the BBC. Tom He's washing up before we go. Come down the end here. These are all the bedrooms. We've got seven bedrooms. Uh, this is my room. It's going to be quite small but functional. Perfectly good enough for a couple of weeks. Uh, and you come into where we keep all the big kit. So this is the garage. We have our boats in here. This is what we use for getting out into the fjord and making sure we can access all the different sites. Uh, and then this is our field store. So all the stuff we need to keep people safe is in here. The fish boots, the jackets, the crampons, all that kind of thing. All the things to keep people as safe as we can in this environment. I hope that gives you a sense of what it's like, that, that station. So it's everything that you need all in that one building. It's your bedrooms, it's where you keep the boat, it's where you keep all your mountaineering gear, it's where we keep the rifles for protecting against polar bears, it's the laboratories, it's everything is in that, in that one building. And all the other stations from the different countries are all similar to that. We all eat together in one big um, mess hall, one big kind of canteen, if you like, from the different places, but everyone lives and works in their own little buildings. But people do cooperate and and work together. And this is how you get around. In the winter and the spring, this is a skidoo like the one out of the, out the front. This is a Norwegian one. Um, you can see on the back there, there's the, uh, the gun case for carrying the rifle. So whenever you go out from the station, more than a couple of hundred yards, you have to go out with a radio, with a flare gun to scare off uh, a bear if you, if you see one. Uh, and in the end, if you need it, uh, a rifle. Um, no bears have been shot. Uh, by scientists from our station, and no bears have hurt anyone from our station in the 30 years that we've had the station. And almost everything we do is about preserving that record, is to make sure we keep people safe and also to keep the bears safe. All the bears are protected in Svalbard, so they can't be hunted. If you see one when you're out doing your field work, then it's the responsibility on you to take yourself away from the situation and, prote and to protect the bear. But if it comes to it, then you have to be, able to be able to protect yourself and the people that you are with. So in the winter and the summer, sorry, in the spring, this is how people get around. Uh, and it is serious. So as you, as you come to the edge of town, there are these signs, uh, and you're not allowed to go out without being kind of equipped to make sure that uh, you can stay safe. Uh, and this is a bear that we saw uh, a couple of seasons ago. Um, and we were take going out in the boat uh, to drop people off at a field site. You can see this is the beach just behind you in the fjord. 
Uh, and you have to make sure that you are kind of looking quite carefully before you land people. Because once you land people and then drop them off there, they could be there for half a day. And these bears can go 30, 40 kilometers in a day walking around. So you have to be really careful that they're not there. So they just waited around for five minutes and a big bear came along and that's your day finished. You have to go back and, and uh, call it quits. The bear is looking for seals that might be on the shore uh, or walruses that are washed up dead. They like those. They will be like a meal for months and months as they are decomposing and the bears are getting into them. So bears are often seen. This is a big male, probably, I don't know, uh, seven, eight hundred kilos, something like that, maybe, big, a big bear. Um, but it's not just down on the shore that we're doing the science, we're also up on the glaciers. So the, the station is surrounded by these big glaciers that are feeding down onto the coast, but also into the, into the sea itself. This is one that's on, on land. So this is a kind of a classic view looking up the glacier, and you can see the start of a, a crevasse, a hole there. Uh, into the glacier. So people are very keen to have a look into those to see what they can, they, what, they, what they, what they can see. And what they're looking for uh, are places like this. So this is, uh, I think, the same, the same glacier that they've come down. I think it's the same image. Um, and what they are particularly looking for is what's growing on the surface of the ice. So you think of the ice and the snow as relatively neutral, relatively inert. But actually there's all kinds of algae and um, kind of... Uh, plant life, very small plant life that grows on the surface of the ice. And as the temperature warms and as the ice changes its uh, kind of dynamics, there is increasing thought about what will happen to those bits of algae that live on the ice surface. Because if they are dark, then they're helping to absorb sunlight. Uh, and if they're absorbing sunlight, they're absorbing warmth, and that's potentially melting the glacier glaciers more, more quickly. So understanding about the kind of the flora, the plant life that lives within glaciers and on the surface is really interesting and important. And we support a lot of this science at the, at the station. Um, but we also get out in the boats. So that noise you can hear is not the boat particularly, that's the boats bumping through these bits of ice. So all this ice has come off the glacier you can see behind and is sort of hanging around in the fjord ready to be washed out with the, with the tide and the wind. This is a glacier that's retreated quite a lot in the last uh, decade or so. It, it was coming up to a, what we thought was a peninsula, but as it's retreated, you can see that that peninsula was actually just an island, and the glacier has, has pulled back. This is being affected by climate change, as all the glaciers in Svalbard are, but some of the glaciers in Svalbard are what they call surging glaciers, so they have a natural cycle that's independent of climate change. And this is where they kind of they speed up and lose a lot of their mass, and then they will suddenly kind of retreat backwards. So this is a surging glacier behind us. So some of those images that you see of, this is what a glacier used to look like 100 years ago, and now this is what it looks like. Some of those will be because it's a surging glacier, which is a natural rhythm independent of climate change. But regardless of that, all the glaciers in Svalbard are retreating because of climate change. So this is the kind of work that people do out on the boats. They're trawling. These are trawl nets, so they will drag these behind the boats, looking at the, uh, the small creatures that, that live in the, uh, the, the seawater, and also getting into the bottom of the, of the fjord. The fjord is deep, uh, several hundred meters deep in lots of places. So they're dragging out the mud and all the creatures that live in the bottom and studying what happens to those creatures, what new creatures are coming in with the warmth of the, of the ocean, uh, and uh, what lives there is really, is really interesting and, and important to, to us. We're also looking at what grows on land. So this is a typical view about parts of, of, of around the Orlison where our station is. So these chambers are actually made of the same kind of plexiglass that you use for police riot shields. So they have to survive the winter and the wind. They get buried in snow in the winter. And the idea, the idea is you raise the temperature of the ground by a half a degree, a degree, and it mimics the kind of conditions that we will see in the next decade or so. And you see what the plant life is doing and how much more it grows and, and all those kinds of things. So we have a few of these sites dotted around where the station is. Uh, this isn't our station. This is the French-German station. But Neolison is a really good place to study the sky. Uh, and this is a, a LIDAR, an upward-facing um, radar, uh, and it's studying kind of the, uh, the atmospheric properties uh, from, the, from the station. So there's a range of different things you can do uh, from the Ollison, kind of science in the station itself, science on the glacier, science out in the boat, and then this kind of, kind of high-end uh, atmospheric science as well. 
This isn't our ship, uh, but this is a ship, a German ship, Polar Stern. And I wanted to show you this one in the last couple of slides, uh, just to talk about how uh, science is also done, of course, from ships, not just from our, our station. So this ship, the Polar Stern, was sent a couple of years ago right into the heart of the Arctic Ocean. This is a photograph from that expedition, where the idea is that they would find a big ice flow, uh, moor up against it, turn the engines off, and just be there all winter to see what happened, basically, and to study the connections between the deep water, the ice, and the atmosphere, because there haven't really been ships, not recently, uh, that have spent the winter in the polar night in the Arctic Ocean. So the, the idea is it would just drift across the top of the, of the Arctic uh, with the transpolar drift. Um, and this is what it looked like uh, in the middle of winter. So the, 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 the ice here is sea ice. It's not the land. Uh, it's probably a metre, metre and a half or so of ice, and then you've got the thousands of metres of the Arctic Ocean below you. And they were there for a whole year throughout the polar night and throughout the kind of the permanent daylight as well, doing a range of uh, science, putting things into the ocean, flying helicopters, drones, balloons, all kinds of things. This is the, called the Mosaic Expedition. Uh, and there was a film about it on Channel 4 a couple of weeks ago, which I think should still be available. Uh, we had lots of British scientists on this, on this boat. So I wanted to show you an image of what it's like in the middle of the winter. You've seen it in the summer, uh, and in the winter it would look a bit like this. The film I'm going to show you is not from this expedition. It's from a Norwegian one a couple of years before that was not in quite the same location, but, but similar. But it gives you a sense of what it would be like to be out in the middle of the Arctic Ocean in the polar night, in the, kind of in the cold, and, the, and coming back to the ship. So here they are on their skidoos, and they've been out doing their science, and they're coming back to the ship. And the light you can see on the right-hand side there is the, is the ship. It's a searchlight. And you can see the, the wooden stakes and the, and the rope on the right-hand side. And that's in case the weather really comes in and there's a blizzard, and you get lost. And you just have to follow those lines, that rope, physically holding it to get back to the, to get back to the ship. So again, what, what, he's, I think it, what they are uh, skidooing over is just sea ice. Uh, you can see where it's mounded up and kind of rafted where it's compressed together. So a, a metre, metre and a half, and then it's the Arctic Ocean, kind of all the way down below you. You see the rifle on his back to protect against bears. And then they've come home, they've come back to the ship. Uh, and that's where, that'll be their home for the, all the months that they were there. So thank you very much. That's kind of what I wanted to say. This is a really cool website, if you're interested. It's a GCSE geography website. Uh, so if you want to know more about um, the Arctic in general and about our stations and things, this is a good place to go. Uh, and the website down below is our website. Uh, so thank you very much for your patience and for your interest. I'm very happy to take any questions if there's time. Uh, and if you would like to come and see us at our Arctic stand, please do. You'd be very welcome. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Henry. That was absolutely amazing. Um, folks, we have just a few minutes uh, to do a bit of a Q&A session. Does anybody have any questions? This is a great chance to uh, uh, ask. What's a cool way to remember which is the north of the globe, which is the south of the globe, between the Arctic and the Antarctic? An easy way to remember the differences of the two. I would remember it in that the Arctic comes from... Um, the Greek word arctos, which is bear, I think. So you know that polar bears live in the north, and so that's arctos, the bear, and that's the Arctic. And then the Antarctic is ant, so opposite, the opposite to that. Is that helpful? Polar bears, that's arctos? Polar bears and ants in very low, very small, way down the bottom. Oh, okay, that's, it. that's better. Yeah, that's better. So ants, <laughs> tiny, down the bottom, bears, big. Yeah, okay, that's all right. I'll remember that. I, I like that as well. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Up there. There's yep. bears down there, no bears. Yeah. That's a good yep. way of doing it. Uh, yeah? Um, how do you become um, a scientist working in the Arctic? What's your sort of career choice? Uh, yeah, so I'm not a scientist. I uh, used to be a civil servant. I worked for the Foreign Office in the Polar Regions Department, and I've done all kinds of different jobs in government. Uh, and then there was an opportunity to work for British Antarctic Survey, promoting what scientists do, or what our scientists do in the Arctic. So my career has been very accidental, really. But the classic scientist career would be that you're interested in science at school. Um, uh, you do a science degree. Uh, and then you do a further degree. And probably you do a PhD, so you become a doctor. 
and then you would work on an expedition or you'd work on a ship or come to our station and then you would kind of progress that way. But we're really keen to make sure that there are opportunities for people kind of really early in their career. So you don't have to think right at the start, I want to be an Arctic scientist. You just need to think, I'm interested in what happens in the world. I'm interested in animals. I'm interested in how things work. And then we can um, show you how you can translate that enthusiasm to the Arctic. So we run courses at our station for people that are partway through their kind of their training and their learning to come and spend time at the station, learn some more skills, get interested in the Arctic, and, and take it that way. So, uh, but in the early stages, just be interested in what's going on and kind of have an inquiring mind. That's that's how they all scientists start. I think. Could I just follow up on that slightly? Uh, you'd mentioned some of the. Uh, it's about 2,000 inhabitants. Um, presumably, there are also people like, uh, say, chefs for the canteen and um, yeah. mechanics who are yeah, not yeah. research scientists, right? There's yeah. a whole community. Yeah. So there's 2,000 people in the whole of Svalbard, so the whole of that's kind of Scotland equivalent. In, the, in this community, at any one time, probably 100, 150, something like that. But absolutely, you can live temporarily and work your career in the Arctic or the Antarctic, and you can be a scientist or you could be an engineer or a chef or a boat driver, or a polar bear guard, or a doctor, or all those kind of different things. Anything that you could do in life, you could do in the Arctic or the Antarctic, I think. Uh, yeah? Have you noticed over the years the polar bear population decline? Uh, I th I'm not an expert in polar bears, but there's around, I think, 30,000 polar bears roughly in the world. Some populations they know a lot about, and other populations not. The bears in Svalbard, Spitsbergen, are quite well studied, um, and those numbers have increased somewhat in the last decades because polar, bear, polar bears were hunted commercially in Svalbard until the late 60s, early 70s, when an act came in to protect them. And I think the numbers are still rebounding in Svalbard. So we don't see bears here in the winter because they're on the east, uh, either denning with their cubs or looking for seals. But they come here in the summer and they're looking for wal dead walruses or they go underneath the bird cliffs and they wait for chicks to fall down or they're raiding eggs and those kind of things. Um, so I think we're seeing more bears come through here in the summer, but that might be because the bears are learning from their, the cubs are learning from their mother that in the summer they can go along the beach and they can find some birds and fox cubs or eggs or other things. So, um, But yeah, polar bears in Svalbard are not, at the moment, in particular trouble, I think. Yeah. Okay, we've got time for just one or two more. I think uh, what I would like to do is make sure we get a couple of uh, questions from the kids as well. I think that's important. If we can go to this young lady here. Do you ever get worried that you might get hurt on the expedition? Uh, I know what you mean, and you've got to be very careful. So um, whenever people come to our station, we make sure that they are fit when they come, so they have to pass a quite a strict medical, so they, they come healthy. And you always need to think about what you're going to do at the start of the day. And it's the weather that rules everything that you do. So you have to know really what the weather is going to do. Because if you're going out in a boat and it gets windy, or if you're going out on the glacier and it gets foggy, then that's when things can happen. So you have to think all the time, what could go wrong and how can I get out of that situation? But accidents do happen, but we have a good track record at this station. But as long as you constantly are worried, a little bit and thinking about it, then that's a good way to stay safe. It's people that don't worry too much or get like overconfident, think oh, I've done this once, I can do it again. It's kind of that's that's kind of that's when it's more worrying. You need to kind of just be constantly thinking about how to keep yourself safe. But no, I've never felt personally in danger. But I think if you were um, our station manager who has been here a long time, he tells a story about when he was out on the sea ice when it was frozen. Uh, and it was quite foggy, uh, and he saw a bear ahead of him. And he said that's the only time he's been really, really worried, because he knew that if the bear came for him, he would have to, he would have to do something. And then he was worried for himself, and he was also worried for the, for the bear. So, Good question. That's a great question. Okay, I think we've got time for one uh, last question. Uh, I think uh, this young lady had her hand up. Uh, it hasn't for me, but you do have to be careful. Um, so you know those images when you saw people on the rope down in the, in the glacier? You have to be really careful because sometimes you can be travelling along a glacier 
on a snowmobile or a skidoo, uh, and the snow kind of filled in one of those holes, and it just looks smooth, and then, and then you're going down. So you have to be really, really careful. So what they will do is they will send someone up uh, who really knows what they're doing, and they'll put some canes, like garden canes, in the snow to mark a safe route, and then you can follow that safe route. But you always have to be thinking about it. And in, um, uh, when they're going a long way on glaciers, you can have a special radar that fits on the front, special machine that fits on the front of the skidoo and looks downwards and can tell you if you're about to go over a hole. So that's, that's a good way of doing it. Brilliant. Well, folks, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you agree with me that we could, we could be here all day asking you questions, but I'm afraid we are basically out of time. Um, so first of all, can we uh, thank Henry once again for... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just a reminder, first of all, of course, we've got the, uh, all the exhibits uh, uh, outside, uh, so please do check them out. Uh, if you don't already have a ticket, then please speak to a member of staff and we'll try and get that sorted. It has been incredibly popular and, and we do have limited capacity, so I can't promise anything, uh, but, but please do ask and we'll, and we'll see what we can do. Um, the other thing is this is just the first of uh, uh, three days' worth of talks, uh, so if you're interested in more stuff, we've got all sorts of things uh, uh, going on. Um, just a little bit, uh, you know, it's, it's the 21st century after all. Uh, if you want to uh, send us any pictures you take on uh, Twitter, uh, we're at RM uh, Greenwich, uh, and we'd love to see uh, pictures you've uh, taken of you interacting with the exhibits. Uh, and we also have the at Arctic underscore office, which is... Yeah. Yep, yep, which is the, uh, uh, the Arctic office. So if you want to tweet them uh, and see how much you... Uh, well, and actually, please tell them how much you've enjoyed the talk. That would be great. Um, and uh, I think we're also using hashtag IceWorlds just to spread things around because we're really keen on um, interacting with you uh, on, on social media. So uh, thank you so much, Henry. Thank, that was thank absolutely you. great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, uh, for coming. Um, please do check out all the rest of the stuff we've got here and at the museum in general and across the Royal Museum's Granite Sites. Um, Hopefully we'll see some of you for other talks uh, during the day. Uh, but otherwise, I'm afraid I have to shoo you out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.
Testing. Testing one, two. T -t -t.
Now, the reason I, I've been shouting and I have uh, been using my mic is because the mic will pick up everything. Hopefully, uh, the captain will hear us. Uh, I think we are good to go. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to the Ice World Festival, specifically welcome to our strand of talks. Uh, we are hoping to go right now uh, live to Captain Will Whatley, uh, who is on board the uh, Sir David Attenborough. Hold on, I'm going to do a quick wave. Can you see us and hear us as well? Yeah. Yes, I can. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. Yes. So uh, you're coming uh, through okay. I was just explaining to the, the group that uh, we, we are very keen to make sure there's time for uh, a Q&A session as well. Um, and uh, that might involve me running out and uh, waving at the screen um, uh, to let you know that we want to start asking you questions. Uh, but just before uh, we do that, I should do a proper uh, formal introduction. I'm going to read it just so we can get this, uh, that I get this completely correct. Uh, so uh, Captain Will Whatley is captain of the RRS, Sir David Attenborough. Uh, that's going to be heading to the Antarctic. Uh, 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 Will uh, joined uh, the British Antarctic Survey at the age of 19. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Wow. Okay. And uh, had his first Antarctic season uh, back in 2015. Uh, so what we're going to be uh, hearing about today uh, is a talk about life on board uh, the uh, ship, uh, life at the Antarctic, um, all sorts of things about what we, what we do on these uh, uh, missions. So I think, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you. Uh, Captain, uh, take it away. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon. Firstly, I'd like to uh, apologise for not being in the room. Uh, this would be a, a whole lot easier if I could be there. Um, but as I'm sure you can all appreciate, one of our major priorities um, before deploying to the Antarctic is to make sure that our whole crew is COVID-free. So um, before we go to the Antarctic, we're going to be doing a hard quarantine and uh, we don't want uh, any positive results to pop up during that so we're, we're being very careful at the moment um, hence why this is on zoom but i will um, talk about uh, what we're going to do in the season and a bit about icebreaking and the ship so i uh, joined this project to build this ship before anything was tangible it was just uh, an idea all on drawings and just on paper and uh, I've been working on the project since the uh, beginning of 2016. And um, I've been surrounded by a great team and we've all worked hard uh, to get the ship to the stage we're at now where we are uh, ready to deploy to the Antarctic uh, for the first time, which is incredibly exciting for the team and me personally, having, uh, having been involved for so long and been working towards this. So uh, we're here um, partly to, to mark this occasion and uh, after we leave here, I, uh, I thought I'd just run through what, uh, what's going to happen next. So um, the ship will be leaving uh, Greenwich on Sunday morning at 8 o'clock. We're then uh, going to Harwich to load some cargo and, uh, and we'll be off to quarantine. And then middle of November, the ship is uh, just going down to Portsmouth to collect some aviation fuel. And then we will be on our way to the Antarctic. We will... Uh, First of all, be calling at the Falkland Islands, which is where the ship is registered in Stanley, um, to collect some fuel and some last minute bits of cargo before going down to Rothera Research Station on the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, Rothera is our largest Antarctic research station, and um, there is a new wharf that has been built there, uh, specifically designed for this ship. So. Um, we are really looking forward to uh, trying that out for the first time and delivering all the cargo. Um, the first Antarctic season for this ship is jam-packed with loads and loads of port calls and lots of logistics work. Um, so it's, um, it's not much of a gentle introduction. Uh, we've, uh, we're going to definitely put her through her paces and make good use of the ship. Uh, one of the, the big uh, tasks for the ship this coming season is to support the Thwaites project. So the ship will be inputting a lot of uh, fuel and scientific cargo into part of the Antarctic called the English coast. And uh, in that area, the uh, cargo will be taken inland to uh, support the, the Thwaites project, which is uh, a massive collaborative science project, which is uh, the biggest science project that uh, British Antarctic Survey has ever been involved in. So it's uh, it's very exciting. The ship will call 
at um, South Georgia as well, uh, where we've got another of our new wharfs that have been built for the ship. So uh, we'll be trying that one out too. The ship will also go to Bird Island Research Station and Sydney Research Station and uh, be very busy taking um, people and cargo backwards and forwards to Rotherham. Um, the season will come to an end towards um, the middle of May when the ship will start heading back to the UK. And we get back to um, Harwich in the beginning of June and uh, we'll then start our maintenance periods and uh, test out lots of other scientific equipment and get ready to deploy to uh, the Antarctic again um, in the autumn of 2022. So um, yes, this next Antarctic season is incredibly exciting and with a very positive mood on board because we're all very much looking forward to getting this ship to the place that we all love to work, which is the Antarctic. So the ship uh, has been on sea trials for quite some time now, and that's been going um, very well. The image on the screen at the moment is uh, when we went for our, our first sea trials, where we were just testing out the ship and making sure everything was working okay. And you can see us passing uh, Tobermory there on the Isle of Mull. And uh, we went all around the Western Isles. And um, yeah, we've been really pleased with the ship and she handles very well. Uh, her maneuvering capabilities are, are very good. We've got uh, a lot more power in the ship's thrusters now, which um, is handy for coming in out of port, but it's also good for when we want to um, do science in rough weather because we can hold station using dynamic positioning, which is a computer which can hold the ship and that um, uses the thrusters to hold us in position. And with the more power, we can hold position in greater weather, which means we can do science for longer in the uh, stormy seas of the Southern Ocean. So, sorry, I'll just click the next slide. So the ship uh, has lots of capabilities. One of the ones I'll uh, talk about first is our boats. We have uh, a work boat called Erebus and a cargo tender called Terra. Uh, they are both uh, very significant names for us. I'm sure you all have heard of the, uh, the Franklin expedition with Erebus and Terra. Um, the, uh, the name of the ship itself went very modern, so we thought we ought to retain some polar history with the names of our boats. And uh, one of the old British Antarctic survey ships called the Bransfield had uh, two launches called Erebus and Terra, so we uh, we kept some past history as well as organizational history uh, by using these names. Uh, coincidentally, after we had named the boats, we found out that the original HMS Erebus was actually built in exactly the same yard in Pembroke Dock in Wales as our Erebus. And um, Terra, the cargo tender, was built um, in Exeter in Devon, just down the road from Topsham, where the original Terra was built. So uh, that was that was quite handy. Um, Erebus is a is a fast work boat with uh, science capability as well. She's got a an A frame um, on the stern with 500 meters of line for doing uh, scientific deployments. And there's a, a shallow water swath bathymetry system, um, so we can effectively map the seabed with it in um, in shallow water, which would be really useful. And um, we can just use it for moving people around at, at high speed. She can do about uh, about 25 knots and um, she's a very handy little boat. Uh, Terra is for getting cargo on and off the ship in places where the ship can't get alongside. So in uh, places like Bird Island and Sydney, which are our smaller research stations, we aren't able to get the ship alongside. So everything has to be discharged into Terra then Terra goes into the, the, uh, the base alongside a jetty and they uh, and we train off the cargo that way. And if we're at a place where they're not a jetty, she can go up the beach and there's a bow door. So the ship itself is a second home for uh, myself and the rest of the crew. We spend half our lives on board. There are two crews. We, we alternate doing about three months each. And it's a very comfortable place to live and work. Um, this is a picture of the bar, which is uh, which is very nice and very large. Um, 
there's day rooms, recreational spaces, so we can um, have plenty of room. When the ship is full, we can be up to 90 people on board. And that's quite a lot of people when they all need space to relax as well. Um, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have a, a great team uh, and we all get on very well. So these spaces do get, uh, do get used quite a lot. The marine crew is around 30 people and that is split into three departments. So there's the deck department, there's the engineering department and the catering department. Um, the deck department is split between um, the deck officers who drive the ship and do all the navigation and, uh, and then there's the deck crew who do all the maintenance and do all the uh, um, scientific deployments as well. And the catering team keep us very well fed. They keep the uh, they keep the accommodation clean and tidy, and uh, make sure we've got enough stores for going away for a long period of time. And the engineering department are exceptionally busy because the ship has an awful lot of systems on board, many of which um, well, they all require regular maintenance. And uh, they're busy at the moment double checking all their lists, making sure we've got all the, the right spare parts for the upcoming Antarctic season. We do all eat together in the same mess room, and uh, and this is it, which uh, which is great. The galley is quite large; um, it needs to be for uh, catering up to ninety people a day. Um, this uh, this is a picture of the galley, this, because we can go to sea for up to sixty days at a time. So we need to keep enough food for 90 people for 60 days, um, and that's quite a lot. So um, my favourite part of the job is driving uh, the ship in the ice and the, the thought process behind ice navigation. Um, when we are driving the ship through the ice, we quite often um, use what we call the conning tower or crow's nest, which is an area above the bridge of the ship and that's so that we can see further ahead um, so we can plan where we need to go through the leads in the ice. Leads are the areas of open water between the ice which is where we want to try and stay if we can if we can make easier progress and then only um, go through the ice where we don't have any other option. Um, I'm actually sitting in the uh, the conning tower of the Sir David Attenborough at the moment um, not because I need to see where we're going in the ice, but because it's the place with the best phone signal on the ship. Um, so I could uh, I could just turn the camera around so you can see the view from Greenwich today. I'm not sure if this will work with the sun, but I'll, you can probably see Happy Sark and the museum there and the heli deck of the ship down there. <laughs> but when we're in the ice, um, we will be using this quite a lot because this is the area where you've got the best view and we can drive the ship from up here. So there's, there's the main navigation bridge where we have control of everything, but up here we've just got main engine controls and steering so we can control the rudders and the propellers, but nothing else. Um, but that's all you need when, you, when you're in the ice and it's, uh, and it's nice and uh, small. So you, get, uh, um, you can't get too many people in here, but uh, that's okay when you're in the ice. So this is a video from one of our previous ships um, the Sir David Attenborough hasn't been into the ice yet. We'll be taking her into the ice for the first time in January of uh, 2022. And uh, we'll be experiencing conditions similar to this. As you can see from this video, when you are navigating through pack ice, um, you have to change your mind quite a lot. And you have to um, just consider your options to try and find the best way through. Because you quite often come to a dead end where you can't make any progress. And you have to back up and try again. Um, it's it's really good fun when you can make progress and uh, you can try options, but sometimes the ice will just um, close in around you and then it's best just to wait for the wind to change because if it's closing in around you, it's normally because there's some pressure in the ice, so it's pushing the ice together um, and then you can't make progress because it's all just pushed together too tight. So when you hit it, it's got, it's got nowhere to go. And the best thing to do is just to wait normally for the wind to change. Um, 
the ship is designed to to break ice so the bow is shaped a bit like a spoon uh so when it when you come to a bit of ice the ship actually rides up on top of it and then breaks it with the weight of the ship sitting down on top of the ice so it can move forward you might wonder why we need to um, do ice breaking um, one of the reasons is to do science in um, the, the seas of the Antarctic, which have ice in them, but also to be able to get to our research stations to supply them with everything they need. We have to go through pack ice to get to them. Uh, so that's, um, that's just part of the job. Uh, when you can see where you're going um, in pack ice, it's reasonably straightforward. But um, when it's foggy or dark, um, sometimes we just stop, but if it's not too bad, you can still make progress if you're very careful about it with the radar. But the ship is designed to be able to move through sea ice, which is just salt water that's frozen. Um, because salt water is not all that dense, it will, it's quite soft when you hit it um, for the ship, and that's what it's designed for. But if the ship was to hit um, fresh water that's frozen, which is glacial ice, um, that's come from the glacier, which normally forms icebergs and then forms bergy bits and growlers, which are the small bits which uh, come off an iceberg. That's the, uh, that's the stuff we want to watch out for, because that's the stuff which could damage the ship. It's quite difficult when you're just looking at a radar image to pick out icebergs amongst sea ice. What you normally get is this sort of shadow effect behind an iceberg, because it normally sits higher than sea ice would. So if you're going through ice like this, you can see these, all this yellow is the radar returns. And the ship is um, at the end of the white line there. Uh, so all the yellow is sea ice, apart from the bit where you get the shadow, which is icebergs, um, which is a, a useful technique for us to be able to, uh, to determine what is um, sea ice and what are icebergs. One of the really interesting parts about uh, being a captain of a ship in the Antarctic is when we want to moor somewhere, we quite often have to make our own berth rather than just tie up to a key um, that's all ready for us. So this is a picture of um, an area on the Ronnie Ice Shelf, which is in the southern part of the Weddell Sea in Antarctica. And we came to here with a with a previous ship, but we, we will be doing similar things to this with the Sir David Attenborough. Um, and we needed to moor up in here to discharge cargo ashore to support a big science project. And we uh, needed to go into that gap where that ice was. So um, we couldn't get the ship in there to scoop it out. So you can see what we're doing there is we're drilling into it so we could put a rope onto it to tow that ice out of the way so we can actually go in and then put our moorings into the ice um, on the right of the picture. So you can see that's us uh, towing that bit of ice out of the way, which made left a really good ice port um, for the ship to go into and uh, worked really well. And we sat in there um, for, uh, for about 10 days whilst we discharged all the cargo and it, uh, it was fantastic. So that is a, uh, is a picture of the, uh, the ship at the Giant's Causeway in uh, Northern Ireland. And that's the, uh, that's the last slide. Um, I'd just like to finish by saying that I cannot wait to take the ship to the Antarctic. We are all really looking forward to it and I'd be happy to take any questions from this point onwards. All right, great. Well, uh, first of all, thank you so much, uh, uh, Captain. Um, I'm hoping uh, people will be able to hear. If, if you please give a round of applause, I'm going to hold this mic. I hope that came through. Um, yeah, so we've got a little bit of time for questions, uh, everybody. Now, what it might be a little, it might seem a little un unusual, but uh, if you've got questions, I'm going to repeat the question um, because. Uh, the captain is going to pick this up uh, through this mic. Does anybody have anything they want to ask? Yes? Uh, okay, so the question was, um, uh, how, 
but so the observation was that uh, when it was uh, docking, there was uh, black smoke being emitted. How does the ship run? What fuel does it use? Um, how environmentally? Uh, what are the emissions of it? Okay, so um, the ship is is a hybrid, a bit like a car. So we've got battery banks and we've got diesel engines. Um, so we burn low sulfur marine gas oil, which is um, the, the most sort of environmentally friendly fuel we can get. The ship's designed to be as efficient as it can and complies with all the latest um, standards for um, shipping and more to, uh, to reduce emissions. But we can't get away from the fact that um, we do need to burn diesel to be able to do what we do, but we try and do it in the most efficient manner possible. Anyone else? Oh, we've got one right up the back. I'm going to come and have a listen. What's the worst sort of sea state that you have to go through in terms of wave height, acceleration? Ah, okay. So the question was, what are the worst conditions uh, that you can uh, put up with? What are the worst uh, sea stakes, as you were saying? Um, how well can it perform uh, before you have to run away? Well, I'm looking forward to finding out. Um, but uh, but the, the ship's designed to be able to uh, deal with the worst seas imaginable. imaginable. It's, um, it's more the people in it that I think would struggle. Um, the main thing we'd have to do to keep the ship safe is just to slow down. We can't, uh, if you go at full power into, um, into some massive, massive seas head on, then uh, there's a good chance we, we could start damaging the ship, but um, we would just slow down and, uh, and try and avoid that. But yeah, the ship could take enormous seas. Um, it's just uh, it's just we don't really want to do that if we can avoid it. All right, fair enough. Uh, yes, your man, if you want to shout, uh, I will relay it. Ooh, that's a good question. So the question was, does the ship go to the Arctic and the Antarctic? Could you go anywhere? Uh, yes, we could. Um, the the long-term plan. Stand Your attention, please. This is the bridge. Can all guests who are currently lunching on the clipper please start making your way down to the art deck? Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, we we like that. I think. Yeah. Good. Um, but yes, the ship will go to the Arctic in the northern summer, and then the Antarctic in the southern summer. Um, so it's, um, it will be busy all year round. Uh, let's, we'll, we'll go through as many as we can. Oh, okay. A question about food. Uh, what are the maximum food supplies you can take? Um, we, the ship's designed for 60 people for 90 days, but we could easily double that. And the other thing we have in mind is if we were to get stuck in the ice and had to stay over winter, um, we, could, we could survive with the amount of food we've got on board. We've got lots of emergency rations as well. Um, we try to get most of our food before we leave the UK for all the frozen and the dried food. So um, next week we'll be storing up with everything we can get um, before we go. And then um, for most of the season, it should just be topping up on, uh, on fresh stuff. Can I just very quickly uh, follow up with that? Can you make requests or can crew members make requests? I mean, can you say, can we make sure there's loads and loads of ice cream or? Uh, Absolutely. I think the, uh, the one thing people seem to uh, request most is their favorite breakfast cereals. So uh, um, yes, that, that, that does get a lot of requests. And it, as I said before, it's our second home. So we need to be able to, uh, to have some creature comforts whilst we're away. Okay, so the question is, uh, what happens to all of the human waste and uh, how do you recycle? Is there, is there a compactor for recyclable materials? Uh, okay, so human waste first goes through a sewage treatment system, which uh, basically purifies it to the stage where I'm told you could drink it, but I wouldn't want to try it. 
um, but it's so that it can be, it, it's so pure it can be discharged. Um, but it, we can retain it and we do retain it as long as we can in the polar regions. But when we're outside the polar regions, we can discharge it because it's super pure. Um, compactor, yes, we do have a compactor. We have an incinerator and we recycle as much as we can. Um, it all gets packaged up and uh, gets brought back to the UK for recycling. So we have quite a lot of waste processing equipment on board and storage facilities for it. Uh, okay, so the question was, uh, what happens if someone gets sick? Is there a, a doctor on board or are there are medical facilities? Uh, yes, absolutely. We have a, a doctor on board and we have a, a hospital with a, um, a two-bed ward. Um, I said to a friend of mine who was a doctor, we had a two-bed ward and they said they would just call that a room, but we like to call it a ward. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it, it's a big step up from what we used to have. Uh, well, bear with me, I'm going to come down the front. So the question is, uh, would you be able to tell us a little bit about the specific research that you're doing? And, and also the great question, I think, uh, what would be counted as a successful mission? Well, uh, a successful mission is if we get everyone home is safe. Um, that is the main thing for success. Um, we obviously want to do as much as we can to achieve science, but safety in the polar regions is paramount. Um, with regard to the type of research we do, um, there are so many disciplines of research that the ship can deal with. So we can do atmospheric science, we can do deep oceanography, we can do um, geology where we can, we've got the capability to take cores of the seabed, um, which are 42 meters deep. Um, we've, we've got, um, capability to deploy um, instruments down to depths of about 7,000 meters if we need to. Um, there's, there's, there's not much that the ship can't do in terms of marine science. So a successful science cruise is where you've got, um, where you, you go out to collect a lot of data and, uh, and you come back with it. Um, that's, that's the main um, marker of success, I would say. All right, thanks. Uh, I'm keen on getting some questions. We've got just a few more minutes. I'm keen on getting some questions from some of the kids uh, as well. Young lady? Um, do you need to share rooms or do you Oh, that's a good question. Do you have to share rooms or do you get your own room? Uh, we all get our own, actually. Are they luxurious? Are they, how nice are they? Um, they are quite nice, yeah. Yeah, we've all got uh, a TV and a sofa and uh, everyone's got, got their own bathroom. So yeah, it's pretty comfy. All right. Uh, let's see, I'll go to this young lady here. Bear with me. What is the maximum depth of ice that it can break through? Ah, great question. What's the maximum depth of ice that it can break through? Well, the specification when we built the ship was for it to be able to break one meter of ice at three knots. Um, however, when ice breaking, the main thing is, as you hit a bit of ice, it needs to have somewhere to go. If it's got lots of ice packed in around it, then you're gonna really struggle. So as long as it's got somewhere to go, we could break through ice that's much, much thicker than that. So it's more about the density of how much ice there is rather than the thickness. Um, so yeah, if it's if it's if there's if it's not that dense, we could go through stuff that's three, four, maybe even five meters thick, as long as we did it slowly. Um, but yeah, if we're just breaking and it's all really close packed in, about a meter. Okay, I think we've got time for maybe just one more, and then. A question: What inspired you to take this career? Ah, good question. Um, what inspired you to uh, take up this career? Uh, I grew up um, doing a lot of sailing on small boats and loved the sea and decided when I was at school that I wanted a career at sea. So I joined the Merchant Navy, 16, and then uh, did a Merchant Navy cadetship, 
which uh, I qualified at the age of 19 with my Austria of the Watch qualification, which meant it's like a driving license for a ship. So I wanted to go and work on an exciting ship and had heard of the British Antarctic Survey. And I thought it would be great to go and work there. And I was exceptionally fortunate that they, a job was going at the time. I applied for it and got it. So it was all pretty simple, really. But um, yeah, I've never looked back since. I absolutely love it. Great. Well, on that note, I'm, I'm afraid, I, I know we would we would ask questions all day, but I'm afraid to say we're, we're out of time um, and we've got other talks and things like that. So first of all, um, can we all say thank you very much to uh, the captain once again. Uh, th thank you very much for speaking uh, with us today and uh, well, we wish you all the very best uh, with the mission. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.
Testing one, two. Testing one, two. How's that level? That is absolutely fine. Cool. Uh, unmute, please.
Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, another of our series of talks uh, uh, as part of our Ice World uh, exhibition. Uh, my name's Ed. Oh, good, we're excited already. That's good. We want to keep that kind of enthusiasm. Uh, my name's Ed. Uh, strangely, I, I'm an astronomer, but I'm going to be your host. You don't have to pay attention to me for much longer. Don't worry. Uh, I'm just going to do a, a, just a little bit of housekeeping. I mean, first of all, if you haven't already seen uh, them or, or you want to see them again, uh, then the exhibition's up on the great map and there's a couple on this floor as well. I, I really do encourage you to go and look uh, at some of this stuff. It's very, very uh, uh, cool indeed, but it's on a sort of slightly different uh, if you like ticketing system, uh, uh, you know, there's so many people um, uh, enthusiastic about this. Uh, we want to make sure we keep control of capacity. So if you don't have a ticket uh, already, then please uh, speak to a member of staff and we'll try and get that sorted out. I can't promise uh, anything, but, we, you know, we just need to sort of filter you through properly. I hope that makes sense. Uh, but let's not worry about that uh, for the moment. Um, I am going to introduce our speaker uh, and I'm going to just see if I can... You Please do correct me if I'm getting any of this wrong. Uh, right. uh, Dr. Alex Brearley is a, an oceanographer, uh, a natural environment research council researcher with the British Antarctic Survey. Uh, who Hang on. <laughs> so hopefully that's all, that all makes sense. Yeah. Um, uh, and is uh, interested, amongst other things, in uh, physical oceanography. And I've got to say has an incredibly... Uh, uh, interesting it sort of draws people in our, our title for the talk is uh, cool robotics for oceanography so i think uh, without further ado i am going to hand over to you alex right thanks ed um and welcome everyone and thank you so much for so much for coming today um first of all has everyone seen the new ship has everyone been down to the harbour side and seen the new ship yeah so everyone everyone's seen our state-of-the-art new research vessel so Obviously, it's in Greenwich Harbour today, um, but the conditions that it's more likely to be in is something like this. Um, so the polar oceans where it goes tend to be very rough, lots of big storms. Um, so it needs to be really well equipped to, to deal with those kind of problems. Um, but also, it's not just a ship. It's also a platform for lots and lots of cool, cutting-edge new technology. Um, and that's what I'm really going to be talking to you about today. I'm going to be talking about robotics, what we use those for, and some of the insights it's giving us into our, our polar oceans. Oops, sorry. That's uh, me going down. Okay, so first of all, for our younger members of the audience, what do they think oceanography is? Any, any suggestions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, taking pictures of the ocean. Yeah, that's one thing. Anyone else? Yep. Yeah. What's the studying the ocean? Studying the ocean. Yep. So all of those different things are true. So the honest answer is there's lots of different types of oceanography. Okay. And I'll show some up here. So there's physical oceanography. That's what I do. So I study ocean currents. I study how the ocean takes up heat. I study how the ocean takes up carbon out of the atmosphere. There's chemical oceanography, so that's thinking about um, many of the, um, uh, many of the uh, nutrients that are in the ocean that fertilize the uh, marine ecosystems, and that obviously feeds into the biological side, both the very small-scale things like phytoplankton, right up to your big charismatic megafauna like penguins and whales. And then even, there's even geological as well, so people who go down and study the, ocean, the geology of the ocean floor, okay, so they drill the ocean drill into the ocean floor, understand the sediments that are down there, the rocks that are down there. So when we're thinking about marine robotics, we're thinking about um, uh, robots that do all of these different types of things. And I'm going to primarily talk about the physical ones today, but there's also, as I say, a whole bunch of other things. And there's a, a whole bunch of great talks this week about all these different types of oceanography. So another one for the younger members of our audience. How much of the Earth do they think is covered by the ocean? There's one very, very uh, enthusiastic gentleman here. Yes? 70%. 70 oh, you be, you're doing pretty well. Pretty much bang on. It's 71%. So, yeah. So, really, when we talk about the Earth, we should really be thinking about it being called water, because most of it actually is water. Only about 29% of it is land. And the Southern Ocean, which is the place that I study... So that's the bit right at the bottom of the Earth. So what we're doing here is we're looking down on the bottom of the Earth here. So you can't even see Britain on this. There's Australia there, there's Africa here, there's South America down here. That connects all those different ocean basins together, the Indian, the Atlantic, 
and the Pacific. Okay, so it's a really important place for the global um, ocean circulation. It's a place where strong winds can blow all the way around the planet. So if you think about it, you've got these strong westerly winds in the mid-latitudes. They blow all the way around the planet in this, in this region. And that has important effects uh, on the oceanography. It means it's a really important place for the uptake of heat and carbon dioxide into the ocean. But it also creates some very, very big storms, as you're about to see. So this was some video taken by a colleague of mine called Eleanor Freiker-Williams um, at the National Oceanography Center. And you're going to see what's it, what it's like to be in a southern ocean storm. So I'm just going to play this. This is taken from the bridge of our current research ship. So bear in mind, this is probably sort of 20 to 30 meters off the ocean surface here. So that they're standing right at the top here. Okay. Yeah. So it's fierce, okay? It can be really, really fierce. And so in order to be able to observe those kind of places, you have to have an array of different types of technology, okay, to do that. The ship itself is not enough, okay? So increasingly, we're turning to robotic autonomous technology uh, in order to be able to observe these wild and wonderful places. The other key thing is that because it is so stormy, it's generally very, very poorly observed. Okay? So we've got Britain up here. Um, and this is just a, a heat map showing the track of commercial and research vessels over a one-year period. I think this was from 2015. Okay? And what it shows is that while the shipping lanes of the North Atlantic, the North Pacific, um, you know, from South Africa across the Indian Ocean are quite well observed by measurements, there's actually very, very few of them in the Southern Ocean. There's these whole white deserts of where there's just a complete lack of data. Okay? So if you look all the way down here, there's basically no measurements done across large swathes of the Pacific, uh, Indian, and Atlantic Oceans uh, over that one-year period. Okay? So we have to have technologies that will fill in these data gaps because we know about the centrality of the Southern Ocean uh, for controlling our climate. So... Another one, for the, another one for the younger members in the room. How would you go about taking your temperature? Anyone know what we'd use a temperature? Yes? <laughs> what are we talking about? That's a very good question. <laughs> We're talking about how would, you, how would you go about taking your temperature? So if you were poorly, how would you go about taking your temperature? Oh, I think we've got an enthusiastic member here. Using a thermometer, exactly. So if, if we, and it's exactly the same principle happens in the ocean, okay? So apart from in the ocean, this thing is about, uh, you know, six foot across and goes all the way down far, into the far, far deeps of the ocean, okay? So this is what we call a, a CTD, and it measures the temperature and salinity of the ocean and allows us to collect water samples right from the surface all the way down to the bottom of the, bottom of the ocean. And how, how deep do people think the ocean actually is in the deep ocean? Any ideas? <laughs> yep. 10,000 meters. That's not a bad guess. It's not a bad guess. Most of the ocean's about five or 6,000 meters deep. Okay? Uh, the Marianas Trench, you're right. The Marianas Trench is, 11 and a half, is nearly 11,500. So, yeah. Very good. Very good. Um, so, we need instruments that can go down and have you know, large pressure casings to be able to understand, uh, withstand that kind of atmospheric pressure. Okay, and so this is something that we would take over the side of the ship, but we increasingly rely on um, robotic observations as well to do this. So we obviously have ships, and that's our, that's our uh, uh, pr previous research ship. That's the um, James Clark Ross that the new ship is replacing. But we also employ increasingly this suite of new autonomous vehicles. So down here at the bottom, we've got um, a, a, um, a what's called an underwater glider. That's a small, low-powered vehicle. It can go for many months in the ocean, taking measurements of temperature, salinity, a, lot, a whole bunch of biological variables. You'll see this on the right here. This is uh, what's known as Boating at Boatface, which um, there's a model of in the museum. Um, so that shows you uh, that's a more, effectively a more capable version, um, shorter range but more capable version of that uh, that you're seeing on the right there. But we also use a whole suite of other things. So we can measure, for example, the skin temperature of the ocean from, from, from large satellites. 
We use long strings of instruments um, to, uh, that are deployed on moorings um, to monitor ocean currents, for example. Um, so, you know, we use this whole suite of different, of different um, uh, vehicles. And increasingly, the, the, you know, the ship that we, we have is really a platform for many of these different types of, uh, of ocean technologies. So a couple of examples. Um, first of all, uh, this is uh, Boating at Boatface. It's actually, uh, its actual technical name is, name is known as Auto Sub Long Range. Um, and what this is, is a, uh, say it's a propelled underwater vehicle. Um, and increasingly, we're using this kind of tech to get into very remote places in the ocean. So one of the, one of the most remote places this has been is under um, large ice shelves around Antarctica. So ice shelves are these huge tongues of floating ice that come out from the continent. Um, there's something, you know, almost all the world's fresh, frozen fresh water is kept uh, frozen up in Antarctica. Um, and that discharges in large glaciers. And those glaciers actually form floating tongues of ice that cover the ocean for several hundred miles uh, out to sea. And we can use these platforms like Boatum at Boatface um, to get into those, into those cavities. And they're really important from a scientific perspective because if we're going to make really good predictions about how much sea level rise is going to happen in the future, we need to be able to get into those cavities to make those measurements in those most remote places. So that's what we're using um, these kind of, this kind of technology for. So this particular mission, um, this is a, a project that was a collaboration between the University of Southampton ourselves at Bass and the National Oceanography Centre. This was actually sent down to explore one of the big submarine canyons uh, in the Southern Ocean. So our polar oceans are places where we get the formation at the surface of really dense waters. Those really dense waters fill up the bottoms of the ocean, the abyss, effectively, of the ocean. Um, and even if you go down, even if you're in the tropical oceans, if you go right down to the bottom of the tropical ocean, you'll find cold water that ultimately came from the poles. And so what this project was doing was to try and understand um, the pathways of that, of that cold water in these constricted canyons uh, in the uh, southern part of the Atlantic. So there is an animation with this. So this just shows an animation of what, of what um, Boti was doing in this particular time. And you'll see um, that it basically traverses along the side of this canyon. And the little... The little things it's dropping are just showing the, the effects of the temperature that it's, that it's taking. And it's really helping to map out the pathways of these, um, of these dense water plumes that are coming out of Antarctica. And we know these plumes are really important. We know they're imp important in those processes of carbon dioxide uptake from the atmosphere and draw down into the deep ocean. That's important because we know that the ocean is a key repository for carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So something like 30% of all the CO2 that's been put into the atmosphere since the start of the Industrial Revolution has actually ended up in the ocean. So the climate situation we're in at the moment would actually be far worse were it not for the role of the ocean. And a lot of the uncertainty around future climate change is actually driven by the fact that we don't know how well the ocean is going to carry on doing that into the future. So understanding these pathways of, of, of deep waters that draw much of this carbon into the, into the deep ocean is really key. And so using these kind of technologies is a really important way of, of understanding that. As I say, um, the other ones, of course, is, is um, the other use for auto sub long range has been uh, to try and get under these uh, big uh, chunks of frozen ice um, so this is a, a project uh, called the FIST project um, that was run uh, from Bass. Um, and so, you know, when we try to look in these cavities that are under these um, ice shelves, we can use a, a number of different tools. So I've got colleagues at Bass who will um, camp out on these big uh, ice uh, on this big these big ice shelves, and we'll drill through hundreds of meters of ice to get into this ocean cavity underneath. Okay, and put moorings there, put measurements there that will take measurements of the temperature and currents in that water column for up to 10 years at a time. Another way of getting it is getting in there is with autonomy, with autonomous vehicles. And, and you know, Boti and others are um, really cool ways of, of doing that. So 
the new ship really will be a, plat a much more purpose-built, equipped platform for uh, understanding these, these kind of processes and uh, allowing us to deploy a range of different autonomous vehicles at any one time. It's not just about the ship and the labs themselves, impressive though they are. It's about you know, doing all of these things together. Um, this was a project I was involved in, so I, I led this. Um, so another really important question is the degree to which um, ice around Antarctica is melting from the ocean versus from the atmosphere. Okay, so in, in much of the world, we think about the warming atmosphere, um, and we think about that melting ice, but actually what we know has been happening around the Southern Ocean um, is that these, those band, that big band of winds that I was talking about earlier, we know that those have been increasing, it's been getting more stormy, um, and what that's doing is changing the, um, through a whole bunch of different physical processes, that's changing the amount of warmer water that's intruding on the shelves around the Antarctic. Now when I'm talking about warmer water here, I'm not talking about bath water, I'm not talking about 20 degree water, I'm talking about water that's maybe one or two degrees above freezing, uh, as opposed to one or two degrees below freezing, okay? But the crucial factor there is that it's warm enough to melt ice, okay? It's warm enough to melt land-based ice coming off the continent. And so we deployed a whole bunch of um, these small uh, robots around the West Antarctic to try and understand some of those processes. So these are um, small buoyancy-driven vehicles. We can deploy these for many months at a time. Um, they go from the surface down to about 1,000 metres deep, so they cover pretty much the continental shelves of the ocean. Um, and every time they come back to the surface, they um, transmit their data, and they say, here I am, where do you want me to go next? Okay, so they're pilotable. And these are really cool, because these you can actually pilot from your phone. Okay, so, we're, so they're not just, it's not just a, there is a, uh, it's not just, you know, command files, this, this is, this is really kind of cool tech. Um, so, yeah, I had these out for um, two or three months uh, for, this, for this proposal. Um, we're gradually increasing the endurance of these. We've got a project for these going out for 10 months this year. So um, the pace of tech is, you know, is, is changing quickly. And they measure a whole bunch of things, so temperature, salinity, and pressure um, for the physical side, um, chlorophyll, backscatter, oxygen, turbulence on the biological side. Um, so this was my team. Um, I'm on the back right there. Um, this was a very collaborative effort, actually, between uh, myself, um, National Oceanography Centre in Southampton, um, the University of Gothenburg, and a bunch of others. And we actually deployed a suite of these different vehicles. So a couple of different types of ocean glider at the front of that picture. Um, and then at the back, we've got what's called a surface vehicle. Okay? So increasingly, as well as the underwater robots that we're using, we're using these vehicles that um, measure the conditions right at the very surface of the ocean. Because the conditions at the very surface, you saw those big storms at the start, those big storm events are really responsible for fluxing a lot of the heat and a lot of the carbon dioxide across the ocean surface. So if we're gonna understand how the Southern Ocean is important going off into the future, we need to be able to understand uh, all those different parts of the system. Okay, so this was a project, we had these out for a, about three months um, in the region between um, South America and Antarctica, a place called Drake Passage, which many of you will see on the map upstairs later. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, please do come and see us in the on the marine robotics stand. Uh, we're all very friendly. Um, so I work with my colleague Hugh here. Leo, is a, a PH uh, Leo has just submitted his PhD, so well done to him. And then we've also got Rachel, who's a postdoc at Bass, uh, and Peter, who's joining us from the University of East Anglia as well. Um, so the stand is up by the great map. Uh, please come and say hi. Um, and I am happy to take any questions. Um, and you can also, as I say, see a glider and another smaller autonomous vehicle up there. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alice. That was absolutely amazing. Um, folks, we've got a little bit of time uh, to do a bit of a Q&A. Um, so what's going to happen is I'm going to come and uh, I'm going to repeat your questions, which sounds a bit odd, but uh, we've got people uh, tuning in on uh, YouTube. 
uh, uh, and so we want to make sure they, they hear everything as well. So uh, I'm going to listen, repeat, and then we'll yeah, no uh, problem. We'll, we'll test Alex with as many questions as we can. So yeah. let's. Uh, you had your hand straight up. What do, what do you want to ask? Mm, I'm not entirely sure. You want to see the, the gigantic round part. Oh, is it the, the map? Maybe you want to see the map? Uh, hold on. Uh, you just want to see it again. Oh, which one? Sorry. This one? Yeah. Do we, do we deploy the... Is the question, do we deploy the robots from the boat into the water? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so we'll use our big ship to go out into the, into the middle of the Southern Ocean and deploy our vehicles. Some of the vehicles we can actually deploy from shore, okay? So the surface vehicles that I was talking about at the end, actually we can actually propel many of those from the shoreline. So that, um, that one I showed in the final slide, the, um, the surface vehicle there was actually recovered in the Falkland Islands, so we piloted it about 500 miles at the end of its mission back into the Falklands, and it was picked up by a small boat in a bay. Um, so we don't necessarily need a very large research ship to deploy some of these vehicles. It kind of depends on the size of the vehicle, though. Obviously, boating at boat face is pretty big, so you need something fairly substantial. But the gliders, I mean, I've done it in a small rib, so a small inflatable uh, in a bay off, the, off Antarctica, you know, just literally trolley in, and, you know, it's gone. Okay, we'll, we'll take some from, uh, we'll go to the middle here. Uh, why did you uh, try to conduct your uh, ocean, uh, ocean oceanography experiments in Antarctica? Why do I decide to, why do I decide to um, conduct oceanography experiments in Antarctica? That's a very good question, because all of our oceans are, as you know, all of our oceans are important places. The polar oceans, so the... Ant oh, sorry, Alex, yeah. can I get you to come slightly this way? Too? Sorry, I might... We'd love everybody... Uh, I might disappearing away. Yeah, no, it's fine. Well. So the polar oceans are um, really important places in our climate system. They're really the linchpin of the whole... Um, the centre of the whole ocean circulation. And the reason for that is because they are the place where surface waters of the ocean, so waters that are in the top couple of hundred metres of the ocean, get made dense by cooling at the surface and by a process which we call brine rejection, which is effectively, as sea ice forms, you get salt ejected into the water. That cooling process and that salinification process, those two things together make those waters really dense. And it means that those waters sink down to the bottom of the ocean. What that can do with it is it can take that CO2 out of the atmosphere um, and that then locks up there for hundreds of years, okay? So it means that the ocean effectively acts as like a buffer on the atmosphere, okay? So the reason it's so important that we go to the Antarctic and we go to Greenland as well, the Arctic, is because that is one of the key places of transformation, I guess, in the, in the ocean system. So, yeah, no problem. Uh, to this young lady here. How heavy is Boatim at Boatface? Uh, it's a few hundred kilograms. So it's probably about the weight of five, five or six humans. Um, so it, it's fairly substantial. It's about five or six hundred kilos. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Um, how often do you go out on the boat? How often do I go out on the boat? Okay, so I would typically go out for one to two months per year. Okay, so most of the time my job is an office job in Cambridge where I will analyse data that I've collected at sea um, and use that to write scientific papers, uh, to understand the oceans. Um, but I will spend typically a month or two per year on the ship. Um, I haven't done any field work for the last two years because of COVID, um, but typically I would go out for about that amount of time. We do have crew, of course, on the ship, and the crew on the ship will be there for many months at a time, taking lots of different science parties to do their research. Um, but, yeah, myself as a researcher, one to two months a year, generally. Okay, we've got time for a few more. Uh, this young man's had his... Yep. What sort of machine is the fastest? 
which, uh, which of the robots is the fastest? Was that the question? Yeah, uh, that's a really good one. So the really fast ones generally, I mean, Boaty is reasonably fast, but the, the fastest ones generally are the surface vehicles. So the, the wave glider that I showed you towards the end, some of those can do two, three, four, five knots. Okay, so they, they are quite, uh, sorry, what a knot is a nautical mile per hour. Um, so they can travel like, almost like little, little ships effectively. The really slow one is the underwater glider. Okay, so that, that, that one I was showing in, in my project. They only do about very slow walking pace. Okay, now that may sound a bit boring, but actually it's really important because it mean, that very slow pace means that they have very low battery consumption. Okay, so they can put them out for many, many months at a time. Um, I say up to six, eight, ten months at a time uh, without having to recover them. So really it's about the choice of robot you use is really about the science question that you're asking. If you're, if you're choosing something that um, has a time scale of, you know, a week or two or a few weeks, then one of the big vehicles is obviously very capable. If you want something that's much more long term, then the much more efficient vehicles tend to be, tend to be the way to go. Okay, we've got time for a few more. I'm just wondering, if, yeah, give me a second, I'll come round to you. I want to make sure we get everybody, but also we can get people in the middle of the rows. Okay, on you go. Is it scary on the boat? Is it scary on the boat? Um, no, I've, I, I, can't say I've, I can't say I've ever been scared. I mean, I have had colleagues who've been in, in bigger seas than me who have been scared. Um, we will tend to try and avoid the stormiest seas. Um, the, the biggest seas I've ever been in, uh, I think the biggest wave was about 15 meters. So what's that? In old money, that's about 50 feet. Um, so it's the height of a you know, three-story block of houses, something like that. Um, they are very, very capable ships. Um, I mean, you certainly get thrown around. You know, the plates will start flying off the shelves and um, everything has to be nice and securely strapped down. But I don't think I've ever been in the stage where I've been scared. Um, you kind of get through an excitement phase. You mainly just get fed up with not being able to sleep. Um, you kind of wedge yourself in a bed uh, and your stomach turns and then your stomach turns and then you're like, oh my goodness. And after three sleepless nights, it starts getting a bit wearing. <laughs> yeah. can, can I just follow up on that? Yeah. I was going to ask you more, maybe not so much scary, but in a more general sense, what's it like to be on board a ship where, if you're so far south, obviously the, the seasonal changes are, are quite extreme there. So, uh, you, you know, what's a day like when you have maybe huge amounts of daylight, for example, in short nights? Yeah, that's right. So, obviously, um, we will tend to go to sea in the summer. So, generally, for the summer being south, that's between kind of December and February. Um, so I'm actually going to see in about four weeks' time. Um, yeah, I mean, once you get south of 66, and, or 66 and a half, you have periods where there is no night time in the, in the summertime. And then in the winter time, there will be no daylight. Okay, so, and the honest answer is it's a bit disorientating to be in 24 hours of daylight. Okay, so you can very easily, you know, be sitting down in the evening, you know, reading a book or, you know, doing something, and you suddenly find it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and your body has not got that natural connection to know that it's night time. So it's a very kind of weird, weird place to be. Um, the flip side, of course, is that in the winter time, when, um, I mean, I'm not generally there in the winter, but our colleagues who are there on the base in winter, there's a period of you know, a month or two where there's really no daylight at all. So they're, they're in constant darkness. So I guess they have the same kind of issue, but it's just, just never light. Um, and you know, the problem, the, that, gets, that period of permanent light or permanent darkness gets longer as you go nearer and nearer the pole. So if you're at 66, it's not, you know, it's not a particularly long period of the year where it's 24 hours of daylight. But if you go to you know, the bottom of the Weddell Sea, it, or, or to Svalbard in the far north where it's 80 degrees north, for example, then you've got many months where it's, uh, it's constant daylight. So, yeah, it's disorientating. Right. Well, I think we've got time for one last question. Uh, this young man seemed very keen. 
What's, it, what's the ship called? So the ship's called the RRS Sir David Attenborough, uh, named after our um, very famous naturalist uh, who kindly agreed to give his name to the ship. Um, and, yeah, we all, I mean, we all think an incredibly worthy... Uh, the ship is an incredibly... Uh, we're very honoured to have Sir David um, give his name to the ship. Um, and we hope that it will carry on much of the legacy that he's, he's done in the, in the public sphere, uh, in the science sphere. So. Okay. Great. Uh, well, folks, uh, I'm a, we would ask questions all day, I'm sure, but I'm, I'm afraid to say we, we're, we're out of time. Uh, this is just one of a, a series of talks that we're doing, not just today, but over the course of the next couple of days as well. Uh, so please do check them out. Please come back. Um, if you want to dress like a penguin and be, take part in the penguin parade, it does, it does make sense. But if, if you want to do that, then please speak to a member of staff. I'm sure you'll be doing that, won't you? Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> Uh, so there's all sorts of stuff going on. Uh, as Alex has said, please come up and uh, see the, the, the robotics uh, part of the, uh, it, well, the robotics exhibit, which is part of the much larger exhibit. There's all sorts of stuff going on up there. So if you haven't checked it out already, then uh, uh, please do. Um, if you've got photos or cool things you, uh, and you want to interact with us, then uh, at RM uh, Greenwich. Uh, we've got all sorts of things going on, and uh, I think hashtag IceWorld uh, links you to absolutely everything. So, uh, first of all, can we say thank you once again uh, to Alex for this wonderful talk? Thank you. Thank you And I'll be hanging around for a few minutes in case anyone was too shy to ask questions in the public session. So, if people want. Brilliant. And uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, coming. Uh, and at that. We have to shoot you out, I'm afraid, because we've got, we've got other things to, to, right. to be doing. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Much.